Good afternoon, world. I'm C. Moody. The word for today is where is your faith when you have to suffer? Now, I heard a commercial on the radio about children dealing with asthma a couple of times, and something about it always confused me. The major quote from it would always say, your child may suffer from asthma, but asthma doesn't have to make your child suffer. Now, I couldn't wrap my mind around that quote because at first it didn't make sense. How could asthma not make the child suffer if they already suffer from asthma? Maybe the commercial was mistaken. But no, it was me. So I looked up the definition of the word suffer and found out that it means two things. While what many of us understand this word to mean, which is to go through pain, troubles, death, distress, disability, etc. What blew my mind about the other definition is it simply means to allow, to permit, to experience, to undergo or go through and endure patiently or willingly. Then the commercial in that quote made sense. The child may experience and endure asthma, but it doesn't have to trouble them. See, the crazy thing about this commercial, once I fully understand it, is this is exactly what our lives are about. This actually defines life. Now, let me rearrange this quote. We all may suffer from life, but life doesn't have to make us suffer. The problem with this is that no one really wants to to suffer. If we could help it, we would want everything to go as smoothly as possible. That's a lot of the reason most people become Christians or turn to any religious group, because they have been taught that Christ is your safety net from trouble. It's your safety net from pain or etc. And if you watch many television pastors and ministries, they tell you all the good things about Christ. They want you to buy into all the riches of becoming a Christian figuratively and literally because they want your money, too. But if you look in the Bible, it talks a lot about suffering. Second Timothy third chapter, verse 12 tells us, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Acts nine, verse 16, Jesus himself says it even stronger. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my namesake. Even by becoming a Christian, it sets you up for suffering from the rest of the world. There are people out there now more publicly than I've ever seen before that hates even the idea of Christ. They slander the name of God and cause anyone foolish who believes in it. And Jesus tells us himself Again, in John 15, verses 18 18 through 20, that if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, They will keep yours also. Now, the million dollar question is, why? Why must we suffer? Most people accepted the idea that we only suffer because we've done something wrong to deserve it, which makes sense because we are all born to sin. And if we aren't fully and consistently working to be like Christ, then there's a 100 percent chance you're going to sin. And because of Christ's words, we also know that we shall also suffer just because of people's hate towards us and what we stand for. But because of these ideas, it causes problems when we don't feel like we've done anything wrong to have to suffer. Or we don't see it being fair for us to suffer because of someone's emotions. This is where we get mad at God. When someone dies to us unexpectedly due to sickness or murder, when bills start to pile up, when our hearts are constantly broken by person after person, there has to be an explanation, right? There is. Sometimes it's the devil. Simply put, imagine a child who is disruptive in class. Now, you may have to think about yourself. I know I did. 
and they get in trouble for it. And once he gets into trouble, he starts trying to pull other people that are doing other things to get in trouble with him. You know, he was doing so. And what about them? This is basically the devil's whole purpose now. An example of what I mean can be found in the book of Job. It tells of a successful man. He has a wide farm thriving with animals. He has 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys. Job had humbled servants, which to clarify, servants in these times willed themselves into it because they needed money, food, and shelter somehow, which is the same as employment in today's time. And a large family of a wife, seven sons, and three daughters. After the days of feasting, he would send burnt offerings according to each of his children, just in case any of his children have sinned and cursed God. That was a great father to already pray and put sacrifices for their child's mistakes. Now, one day, the sons of God, the angels, came to present themselves before God. And in the midst was also Satan. And God asked him, where have you come from? And he, Satan replies, from roaming throughout the earth. And God begins to brag about Job, even calling Job perfect. And that's the story for another time. Because he respects God and shuns evil. Satan challenges God by asking him, why does Job respect you? It's only because of all the things you've granted him. Now let me take all these things away and I guarantee he will curse your name to your face. So God accepts this challenge and says, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself, put not forth thine hand, which means you can do everything around him, but not to him. So with that, Satan destroys everything Job has. He had raiders, which were called Sabians, stole the oxen and donkeys and slain the servants, which killed the servants. Fire fell and burned up the sheep and the other servants. Another group of raiders called Chaldeans stole the camels and killed the rest of the servants. And a great wind destroyed the oldest brother's house, killing all of Job's children. Now, <laughs> most of us wouldn't have been able to handle just one of these things, let alone all of them. But in the midst of Job's suffering, he did something miraculous. <laughs> in the midst of his suffering, he didn't allow himself to suffer. Instead, he simply said, the Lord gave and the Lord have taken away. And Job didn't sin against God. He didn't curse his name as the devil tried to make it seem he would do. So now the same counsel returns. And God once again brags on Job about his perseverance from Satan's attacks that had no purpose. But Satan is not done here. He now challenges God saying that any man would give everything for his own life. But if you let me attack his body, I guarantee you that this time he'll curse you to your face. So God once again accepts his challenge, giving him the power to do anything to him but to save his life. So now the devil attacks Job, afflicting him with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. All that Job could do is take broken pottery to scrape and scratch himself as he sits helplessly among the ashes. Now, Job's wife is done by this time. If you read verses 9 and 10 in the second chapter of Job, it tells you that his wife said unto him, Doeth thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and just die. Now, Job's wife has seemed to have grown angry with him because he didn't act like he was suffering. Job was somehow still handling everything as if it was a common day. Now, back to the text, Job responds and he said unto her, Thou speakest as of one of the foolish women speaketh. Now, Job doesn't mean that he's saying his wife is an intellectual, like just saying like she's stupid. But the Hebrew word translated as foolish or fool means blindness to truth. And in this case, spiritual truth. So basically, he's asking her, woman, where's your faith? The text continues, what shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job didn't sin with his lips. Now, this shows us that some of suffering is simply because the devil wants us to stoop down to his level. I mean, think about it. 
He has been banished from the kingdom of God until the day of judgment, where he and all those with him will be destroyed in the lake of fire. So as the old saying goes, misery loves company. The devil is on a mission to show God that we are just as evil, just as untrustworthy and ungrateful as he was while he dwelled in heaven. So the devil may take some things away from us, but only by God's permission. But why would God permit this? My opinion, God wants to trust us. If we can allow ourselves to turn from God by these little temporary things of earth, he doesn't want us in his kingdom. If we can get so swayed to turn away from God from all these things that are temporary, why would he want us to dwell in something eternal? So my message is to say you have to suffer. So is that it? We just go through things because either we've done something bad to receive consequences, people hate us, or because simply put, Satan is trying to get us to be cast out like him. What good does that do for us? And honestly, it actually does us a world of good when we prevail from the suffering. When we go through things in life, things we must suffer, we allow ourselves to sulk, to dwell in our misfortunes. Even Job, though he defended his righteousness, was dreading the day he was born because of his sufferings. But what Job did was never give up. He never cursed God. He didn't understand why he was suffering, but he wouldn't be persuaded by his wife to curse God, nor by his friends to admit a wrong he did not commit. What you have to understand about suffering is suffering produces if we look to the end of Job's suffering, God blessed him with double the fortunes he lost. God gave him 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 donkeys. Finally, God gave him seven sons and three daughters. Now, no matter what form of suffering we go through, if you continue to stay on your path, you will see the produce, the produce of your sufferings. Where we mess up at, is that no one wants to suffer. No one wants to endure such tragedies. Why? It's not because God isn't powerful enough. The reason is because we don't know what we'll produce from our sufferings. We still want to have control over what we go through and how we suffer. That's where the phrase comes in, where is your faith? But it doesn't make sense to suffer for something not guaranteed when you're getting by, sort of. See, this mentality is called being comfort comfortably miserable. For example, you're lying on the couch, but you know that your bed is a thousand times more comfortable. Yet, you won't get up because you've gotten in the right spot where your couch is manageable. This is a product of our lives. We know that if we get up, we can end up with something better than where we're at. But we don't want to go through taking the journey. What makes life even scarier than this scenario is that we don't know what is the result, what lies in our future. So we really don't leave what we know for something that's not promised. Yeah, I want to live better. Yeah, I want to lose weight. Yeah, I want a bigger house. I want to be able to do more for myself and my family. But we choose instead to be comfortably miserable. So I ask you again, where is your faith? For people who have or want to grow muscles, your body has to suffer because you can produce larger and more defined muscles. And when you build muscle, they go through a process called hypertrophy. This means that your muscles endure trauma, splitting apart a muscle tissue. And then your body works to repair the damaged tissue, resulting in larger muscle tissue. This is why when you work out and afterwards you're sore, it means that you ripped your muscles literally. And now it's working to repair it to make it bigger, to make it stronger, to make it better than before. This is what I meant earlier when I said suffering produces. A better example. What do you think makes apple trees? It's just by the seed of an apple that can grow into a tree that produces many apples. But how does this seed become the tree? Now, besides the nurturing,